will trust what we put on the screen. And if you're a note taker, this is a good one to take notes to. Last week, we started teaching on the doctrines of Christ. And we talked about uh, the first doctrine, which is probably one of the most doctrines, uh, most important doctrines in the Bible, and that's repentance from dead works and living by faith toward God. Amen? Without that, none of us have salvation. And uh, I'm going to read for you again Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 out of the, the King James Version. And uh, we're going to read this as a basis for what we are going to teach tonight. Uh, the writer of the book of Hebrews said, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, and uh, that could be said doctrines of Christ, uh, but every believer, every Christian uh, needs to know those principal doctrines of Christ. And it's amazing to me how many people don't. Uh, they know a little bit, but they don't know the depth of the doctrines of Christ. The reason they're called the doctrines of Christ is because Christ taught these things and then the apostles continued to teach them as well. And he said, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. Now, I believe the writer of Hebrews said, we will only do this if God permit, because until you get these things down, you really have not laid a foundation in your life, and you don't have roots. Uh, and it is amazing how many people you can see tonight. We've got, what, 11 people here. A lot of people don't care for the root building, teaching. Uh, a lot of people care more about the evangelistic preach me happy uh, type things. But you've got to have some basic doctrines established in you, in your thought life, in your spirit. Uh, otherwise, you will, you can't go on to perfection. Somebody say amen. amen. And so tonight we're going to talk, uh, after you've established the wonderful fact that you uh, have a right to repent of your sins, and repentance is the gateway to salvation, uh, then the, the writer of Hebrews said, uh, we're going to leave the doctrine of baptisms. And the doctrine of baptisms, the reason it's plural, is there is uh, several mentions of different types of baptisms, in the New Testament, Jesus talked about uh, more than one. And so there are doctrines of baptisms. What is a baptism? A baptism is, as we all know it, when a person is immersed, uh, all right, they're immersed in water, water baptism, believer's baptism. That's the one we're most familiar with. Well, what does it symbolize? It, it symbolizes a person going into the water, which is a cleansing agent, and coming back up cleansed. Amen? Amen. And uh, the Bible actually calls it washings. Uh, when we talk about uh, the first form of baptism that most people are familiar with, water baptism is the most familiar of all believers because um, I can guarantee you almost everyone in this place has been baptized. And uh, you should be baptized because it was a command of Christ. It was a command of the apostles, the chief apostle, Peter, who uh, the Bible, Jesus said, uh, he gave him the keys to the kingdom. And so it's important Many people don't understand it or they wouldn't get baptized. Uh, it's a serious thing to be baptized in the name of the Lord, walk away and never serve the Lord. Yes. Amen. Um, 
There are other baptisms, and I'm going to go through them real quickly. John's baptism of repentance. We read that in the scripture. It was a baptism to prepare the way for the Messiah. And uh, John's baptism was was uh, dealt with even later on in the book of Acts by the Apostle Paul. Because there was many who were baptized by John and they repented publicly and were baptized. Uh, even Jesus was baptized by John to fulfill scripture. You remember that. And that was the baptism of repentance. It was a, a preparation uh, so that you could bring the Messiah onto the scene. Amen. And then there's the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Now I want to ask this question. You can raise your hand and tell me. Who baptizes with the Holy Ghost and fire? Who is the baptizer? Somebody say it loudly. Jesus is the baptizer. And for many years I have preached and tried to get people to understand. I don't baptize anybody with the Holy Ghost. There's not a human out there that can baptize somebody with the Holy Ghost and fire. But the Bible says that he, John said, he, meaning Jesus, that comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. So if you have been baptized, you have been immersed and filled to overflowing with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Jesus did that for you. There's no man that can do that for you. I can water baptize, but I cannot uh, baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. But if you have been filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to get me excited tonight. If you've been filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, then Jesus baptized you. Oh, what a wonderful thing. And then the Bible talks in the New Testament of, about the baptism unto Moses in the cloud. The baptism unto Moses in the cloud. Then uh, the Bible speaks of, and Jesus spoke about a baptism unto death. All of us, whether we like it or not, we're going to be immersed in death. Our physical bodies. But our spirit is eternal. And even though our bodies will fall into the baptism of death, our spirit will be forever with the Lord. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 29, we're going to deal with the issue of baptism for the dead. All right. Uh, I told you there was more than one baptism. And some people have never even studied these things. Uh, believer's baptism in water. It is the believer's first act. Let's say that you felt convicted of your sin-filled life. I'm a sinner. Lord, I need you to forgive me. I confess I'm a sinner. I can't forgive myself. No man can forgive me of the things I've done because I've sinned against God. You see. And I've done things I'm not proud of. I, I did them out of ignorance, but now I know that they are a sin. So I repent. I turn away from my sin, and I want you to, I confess you with my mouth to be the Lord of my life. That's important. But the next step, the next step is believer's baptism. Anybody who refuses to be baptized is a disobedient disciple. You can't be a, dis a disciple of Christ and be disobedient. It would be like me walking into a karate studio and saying, Sensei, I want you to teach me karate. Haya, And kicks. And, and I know it's funny, but you'll get the point. And I walked in and he said, do 50 jumping jacks. And I said, I don't, well, I don't want to. And he said, well, uh, you're kind of old and, and frail, so I'll let you get away with, with doing these simple push-ups. And I said, no, I'm not going to do them. You know what the instructor would do? Get out of my dojo. Yeah. Because I can't teach you anything because you're disobeying everything I command you to do. 
And so people, when they come into a, a relationship with Christ, and then they say, and they're disobedient to the command of Christ, then they're not really a disciple. And there are people who will disagree with that. There are people who will say, oh, that's not right, that's not, but you can disagree all you want. But Jesus commanded in the Great Commission and in uh, Mark chapter 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Uh, Matthew 28 and 19, go ye therefore into all the world, baptizing them. He, he didn't even say anything about repentance because there's no need to be water baptized if you haven't repented. So water baptism is your first act of, of two things, submission to the word and obedience to the command. So uh, it is an important thing, believer's baptism. If, if someone tells you there's no need to be baptized. Run. Because there's a thing out there called easy believism that is deceiving many, many people. Uh, we have to be obedient. And, and water baptism, there's much more that I could teach you on water baptism, but I, I won't. Uh, but water baptism is an amazing thing. I do want to tell you, though, it is the action that is a response. You remember the scripture? Faith without works is what? Dead. It's dead. So faith without actions is not faith. So faith is, and the action of baptism, that is a response based on true repentance. When a person truly repents of their sins, Lord, I'm going to follow you. You've forgiven me of everything I've done wrong. You don't have a problem getting in a tank and being water baptized. But a person who wants to pick and choose out of the scripture what they want to do and what they don't want to do, they will not stick as a disciple. Uh, so if a person has truly changed their mind, they won't have a problem with water baptism. It does not bring, I want to make this clear, being dipped in water, I don't care what's invoked over you, it does not save you. It doesn't. It's not salvation. How do I know that? Because I've baptized many that you thought they repented. You baptize them and you never see them again. They don't read the word, they don't pray, never come back to church, just got baptized, it made them feel religious, it made them feel somewhat holy. Are they saved? Absolutely not. Being dipped in water, I can dip you a hundred times, but there's got to be a conversion. There's got to be a repented heart that turns from sin and to God, otherwise baptism is you're just getting wet. Amen. Uh, it, it does not bring salvation, but it is a response to salvation. Now, when you repent of your sins and you confess that Jesus Christ, he's the Lord of your life and you mean it with everything you've got, then baptism, whether it's private or public, is saying to everybody else, I believe this thing. I am convinced of this. I want everybody to know that I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Amen. There should be no shame in publicly being baptized and saying, I mean this. And then it is also a believer's identifying with their Messiah. Do you know how dangerous it was in the New, Church, uh, the New Testament era for a person in front of Romans who claimed Caesar was their God. 
and in front of Jews who said, we don't believe Jesus was the Messiah, they crucified him. Do you know how dangerous it was to be baptized and then to be baptized in the name of Yeshua, which is Jesus? It was almost a death sentence in those days. But we can come and be baptized and not fear for our life. What a blessing that is. Amen. Now, water baptism is also symbolic, and it teaches us several other things. Uh, this is important to know, and I'm going to kind of zip through it. It is symbolic of Noah and his family. You know how Noah, eight souls, were saved? They were saved because they got in the ark. They were saved from the water, by the water. The water lifted them, and it's symbolic of Noah and his family were saved from the wrath of God by the water. You know, uh, they couldn't swim that long, but they were in an ark that saved them. Amen. Now, the Israelites, they were following Moses through the Red Sea. You remember they came to the Red Sea and the Egyptians were right behind them. And first God put up a pillar of fire and that scared the Egyptians for a while. And uh, then they began to go around the pillar of fire. And the, the people cried out and said, "You, what are we going to do? Moses even cried out to God. And, and the Lord said, what's in your hand? A stick. Let me, let me show you something about baptism. There are Baptism in its basic sense is just a human being being dipped in water and coming back up. In that sense, it's just a simple act of somebody getting wet. But remember, Moses, all he had in his simplest form was a stick. But Moses believed the voice of God and took that stick and stretched it out over the water, and the waters parted, and the Israelites were saved by going, listen, going through the water. And they came out of Egypt, which represents sinful world, and they went to their promised land. So when a person is baptized, yes, they're just dipped in water, but there's something fantastic that goes along with that. We leave the world of sin, Egypt. We go through the water of baptism. We come out with a brand new name, the name of Jesus Christ upon our life. And guess where we're going next? Actually, we're going to heaven, but we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and God comes into us. Amen. Thank God for believers' baptism. And then we can also compare it, and this is the greatest comparison. What did Jesus do? We know that he died. He died. Then he was buried. He stayed in the tomb for three days. But then he rose from the grave with a glorified body. He was different than before. So baptism also symbolizes the death is the repentance that we do. We die to ourself. We die. We repent. That's a dying to yourself. Then we are buried in baptism, and that's our burial. Many scriptures confirm this. You're buried in a watery grave, and when you come out of the watery grave, you now have an identification that's not like your old uh, identification. When you were baptized, Lisa, uh, your past died in that watery grave. The old man dies through repentance, and then symbolically we are buried, and then when we come up out of the water, guess what? We're not identified with our old life. We're identified with a brand new life in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And uh, what a wonderful thing that is. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. The life figure, Peter was teaching on baptism, 
And he said, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not from the putting away of filth of the flesh. Most people come to baptism and they've already taken a bath. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it has nothing to do with cleansing your body. You can do that at home. But it has more to do with the cleansing of your soul. And Peter was saying this. He said, Whereunto baptism doth now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer, listen, of a good conscience toward God. So when you come out of that water, your conscience is cleansed. Why? Because you obeyed the scripture, the command of Christ. And you come up out of the water a brand new creature in Christ. Praise God. So it is a wonderful thing. Uh, and then he said, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So you see the symbolism there. Now this scripture is not saying that the act of being immersed in water saves an individual. It is saying that the believer who is baptized is more safe from the wrath of God and an impure conscience. Amen. Uh, you have to be careful with making baptism some kind of mystical, ooh, that water's got magic in it. I watched a YouTube video the other day, and an and a, uh, untrained novice in the gospel was throwing anointing oil in there, and he was waving his hands over it, and he was swirling the water around and saying, in the name of Jesus, and, and all demons come out of, of uh, and it was just a joke. It really made me sad. And they had people lined up 50 long baptizing them, not knowing the truth about baptism. Amen. So we are saved from the wrath of God by our faith in the finished work of Christ. And we are washed. Remember, baptism is a washing. Where do we get that from? Well, in the Old Testament, that's where this all started. In the Old Testament, if a person would touch a dead body, they couldn't go back in the temple and worship or the tabernacle and worship. They couldn't even bring a sacrifice until they had done the ritual cleansing, which is the mikvah. Uh, and there were several other things that you couldn't do until you went through mikvah. And this mikvah is symbolic of believer's baptism. Amen. Why am I teaching on this? Because... There's been much information and teaching lost because nobody teaches on baptism anymore. And it's dangerous because people will say, well, I went to a, a gospel concert, and at the end they had me repeat this prayer. Then they told me I was saved. Was there really a repentance? Was there any admonition to go to a church and do as the scripture commands? Almost never. It's, bloop, you're saved. And live how you want. Don't join a church. There, listen, we've got to be obedient to the whole word. Not just the parts that are easy. Amen. Uh, hallelujah. Isn't it good to know that your conscience is washed? Conscience is lost. So a believer's water baptism is only meaningful if they have truly trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ and by turning toward him by a changed life. Amen. Now, let's talk about some other baptisms. I've got about 11 minutes left. And uh, I'm going to start off with the one that is the most, it's been distorted but let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15 and 29. 1 Corinthians 15 and 29. And this is where people can take one scripture out of context and form a doctrine and mislead a lot of people. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then baptized for the dead? 
I uh, watched a sermon the other day on YouTube. You can watch any kind of doctrine on YouTube. And a person was teaching how that you could be baptized and you could pay money for your relatives that didn't know the truth and died unsaved. That's a bad error. The Bible does not back that up. There is no baptism for the dead. Amen. But Paul was not condoning baptism for the dead. You have to read this in context. But he was using this to prove that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Amen. And for judgment and for rewards to the believer. Hallelujah. I can't be baptized for my fifth grandpa. He lived his life. If he heard the gospel, he's responsible to the gospel. I'm not responsible for anybody else's salvation. So I could be baptized 15 times, but they are responsible for their life. Amen. You can't give a bunch of money and get people out of a so-called purgatory. Purgatory is just a golf course on State Road 37 that looks ridiculous to play. It's not a real spiritual place. Amen. You see, the Sadducees, there were the Pharisees and there were the Sadducees, and they were saddest of the both of them. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Did you know that? The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection, and they also didn't believe in angels. This fellow believes in angels. I know because I've been in situations that there was no way I should have got out of that alive, but angels were there watching out for me. But they didn't believe in a bodily resurrection, and they did not believe in angels. And baptism cannot be uh, a means for getting people out of an unsaved commit condition once they have died. And Paul was in no way condoning baptism for the dead, he was using their error to prove that there will be a resurrection of the dead. So don't let anyone confuse you about that. There are groups that will twist your mind into a pretzel and make you think that's true. Some of you are nodding your head, but it's not. Amen. Now, let's talk for a moment about administering baptism. Uh, baptism cannot be administered uh, for anyone except a repented believer. And you've heard me say this. I don't know if you've repented or not. I have to trust you or trust a new convert that they have repented. Only God knows when a person has truly repented of their sins. And so that's why it's it's a careful thing when you baptize somebody, uh, you just want to believe that they have repented. Um, and so, and you don't want to baptize someone, you can baptize someone, I want to get this straight, who was believed that uh, they were baptized at an earlier time, but they didn't have sincere faith. I'll give you some examples. I've had people come and they were baptized when they were five. They didn't have any clue why they were getting baptized. All the other little kids were getting baptized. Mommy, I want to get baptized. Okay, let's get you baptized, Susie. Okay? We, we do not believe, and I don't see it scripturally, uh, unless God shows me a greater revelation in infant baptism. Because that infant doesn't even know how to talk or how to form thoughts just yet. So how could they put their faith in Christ and how could they repent of sins because they haven't done any yet? Now, they've been born into sin, but splashing some water on a little baby's head is meaningless because there's no reference of any of that ever being done in the Scripture, ever. And I sure wouldn't want to hold a, a squalling three-month-old <laughs> under the water. I'd be... They'd say, boy, I don't like that preacher. Um, now, when do we rebaptize a person? If baptism was done in an unscriptural manner, 
All right? And there are baptisms that are done in an unscriptural manner. Sprinkling. I challenge anyone to show me where sprinkling was done in the New Testament church. It was never done. Somebody said to me one time that they couldn't have baptized 3,000 people on the day of Pentecost because there wasn't enough water in Jerusalem. Uh, I beg to differ with that. The scripture itself talks about the abundance of water, the pool of Siloam. They would have had to have had quite a bit of water to cleanse the temple of all the blood and the sacrifices. Jerusalem had plenty of water. Just a few years ago, uh, an archaeological dig near the existing temple showed where there were many, multiple, hundreds of, they called them baths, but they were there for mikvah. Because you couldn't come in the temple until you were washed according to the law of Moses. So there was plenty of ways for them to be, to be water baptized. Amen. Now, if a person was baptized and the name of Jesus Christ was not invoked over them at baptism, it's not scriptural. It's not because every example in the scripture where a person was actually baptized, they were baptized in the name of the Lord, which is Jesus, or in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first Gentiles that were baptized in Acts 10, Peter commanded, he didn't just suggest it to them, he commanded that they be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When If I were casting demons out of somebody, guess how I'd be doing it? In the name of Jesus Christ. When I pray over my food, and I end my prayer in the, na in the name of Jesus Christ. So the scripture is clear about baptism and the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Messiah, who is our Savior. So why would we not have that name invoked over us in baptism? Oh, pastor, does it really matter? If it's in the scripture, it matters. And we can't water that down just to fit in. We must believe the scripture as it's written and as it was enacted, uh, so there have been multiple times I have uh, rebaptized people because they've seen this. Now, if a person has been baptized in the Church of Latter day Saints, I will rebaptize them. If they've been baptized in the Jehovah Witness Church, I will rebaptize them because they preach another gospel than the one that is biblical gospel. Amen. And uh, baptism is an act of faith. Now, believer's water baptism is in the New Testament, and it's something that we should consider. And uh, again, the writer of Hebrews said, these are principal doctrines to be understood. Amen. Um, hallelujah. And then... We're going to spend just about three minutes on the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and we'll continue next week. Matthew 3.11 in the King James Version. This was Paul, or Paul, it was John the Baptist. I've got my names wrong tonight. Matthew 3.11, John the Baptist. I indeed baptize you with water unto or because of repentance. You've repented. You see that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the Messiah is coming, and I'm baptizing you unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. So you see we're taking another level up. We're going from repentance to the one that is the greater one, Jesus Christ. He said, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize or immerse you with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, and with fire. And that's where we get our teaching from, that Jesus is the baptizer. Praise God. Uh, so John was saying, and John said, he's going to increase and I'm going to decrease. 
And so we know how that John was imprisoned because he was a bold preacher. And the king, uh, the leadership of that day didn't like bold preaching. And so they imprisoned him and then they decapitated him. And he was off the scene. So that ushered in the way for the Messiah or the more perfective way. And he said to them, when he comes and when he does what he's supposed to do, and his ministry was only three and a half years, then guess what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Ghost came and it baptized 120. They spoke with other tongues and then 3,000 were added to the church, 5,000 added to the church. Lord, baptize us with the Holy Ghost all over again. Because if there were ever a town that needed a move of God and needed a fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost, it's Elwood, Indiana. And the only thing that's going to change this town is when people begin to say, I don't know what they're doing in that building, but when I walked in the door, I felt something that I've never felt before in my life. The power of the Holy Ghost. Now, the fire, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can have the Holy Ghost and nobody sees it in you, but they see it through your love, through your faith, through your actions. They're going to know you're filled because there's going to be a fire in you. Now, I can't see the fire of the Holy Ghost in this room right now, but guess what? It's here. It's here. Everybody you work with, everybody you know, they ought to know who to come to for prayer. Because there's a fire in you through the power of the Holy Ghost. They just know that they know that you're going to get the prayer answered because you are filled with Almighty God. And the fire can burn through anything. Hallelujah. Uh, my son called me today on the phone and he's having some back issues and some back trouble. And he's not where he needs to be with the Lord. And I said, son, I'm going to pray for you right now on the phone. Is that all right with you? Yes, Dad, that's all right with me. So I went to my office, shut the door, we prayed, and I'm expecting God to heal him. Why? Because he needs to have a touch of the real thing again. Right. Amen. And uh, listen to this scripture. In the book of Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he was our example went straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, John the Baptist said, You need to baptize me. And Jesus said, No, do this for Scripture's sake. But notice what happened at baptism. Jesus went down in the water. He comes up out of the water. And the Spirit of God descends on him like a dove. And then a voice signifies who he is. When you are baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Spirit is present and active with you. And the name of Jesus identifies who you are. You're a child of the King. You're identified by the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Glory. When hell looks at me, when demons look at me, they see that I have the name of Jesus is applied to my life. Demons ought to be afraid of us. Praise God. Jesus is baptized and the Spirit of God comes down upon him. And this is our example. If Jesus was baptized, then we should have no problem being baptized or telling someone else that they should be baptized. Now, don't be rude or obnoxious about it. But when a person has come to repent, we need to encourage them to be baptized. Amen. And uh, it's a wonderful thing. The Spirit of Christ identified him. The Father identified him. This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. Guess what? When you're baptized in the name of Jesus, God is well pleased with you. And your life will signify that. Amen. I'm run out, I've run out of time. Uh, next week we're going to talk about the baptism of death. Then we're going to talk about 
the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Do you know that when you're born again, when you get to heaven and God judges us, you're going to get rewards? There are levels in hell. Hitler is in a more tormenting place in hell than somebody who just lived and rejected Christ. There are levels in hell. There are levels in heaven of reward. I want to get the most I can get. Praise God. Let's stand tonight. We're going to pray. I hope you've gotten something out of this.